okay. pick something. You got something picked? Yeah. Cool. I have with me today someone that I am very excited to have on this show, and I'm going to read from her Twitter description as a way of introing. Believes survivors, I love this part, fight me. <laughs> Author of six books, child sex abuse survivor and advocate, founder of hashtag sex abuse chat, hashtag Monday blogs, at bad redhead media the author of many books one of which i love which is broken pieces one of the ones that i was introduced to you through thank you for spending time with me today rachel thompson thank you for having me kevin really happy so, to be here so grateful do you know how i first uh, i guess found you and paid attention and thought oh i really really want to know rachel no tell 30 me. day it was the 30 day Oh, the book marketing challenge? A 30 day book marketing challenge, which if anyone, if you haven't grabbed that, go ahead and grab that now. It's really, it, it's uh, available for, for download and, and for purchase. And it's been a wonderful, I guess, uh, guide for me would be one thing, but a reminder too of what it takes to not only publish, but to market something. And when we're marketing something, it's, a, it's interesting, it's a 30 day challenge. Because mm -hmm. when I opened up the book and I looked at all the contents and the table of contents, I said, well, I've done half of these things. Mm -hmm. And then I read the book and I said, oh, gosh, yes, I've done them, but and yeah. I've done them and and I've had to work through. So I think of it more as uh, an ongoing challenge. And I'm wondering, does it ever get easier? No. <laughs> I mean, I do this for a living for other authors, right? I mean, I probably have maybe 10 or 12 clients right now, which is more than I normally would take on. And I have assistants as well who help not only with my clients, but also to keep me in the mix because I get lost. I have to hire people to help me schedule in tweets and posts and create giveaways and put marketing stuff out there because I can't possibly do it all myself. It's ongoing. And this is really what I say to people. Um, lots of writers think that marketing means selling their soul, and it, it really doesn't. It's about connecting with readers and forming relationships and that's and being your authentic self. And that's really what it is all about. And so share what you're comfortable sharing. Find whichever platform, a social media platform is most comfortable for you. And that's pretty much where you're going to hang out and connect with readers. But no, it never ends. I mean, publishing isn't just writing books. And I think you're right. And it doesn't end and it doesn't get easier. But you just made a really good differentiation between what's what I can do and what I need others to do. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things I've learned over and over and over again, it's not only what I can do, because eventually I can do anything. I can learn how to be a brain surgeon, not tomorrow, but over a period of time. Sure. Do I want to do that? Am I good at doing that? Am I going to find joy in that? And I love your phrase, which is, you know, I, I don't put my soul into this. I keep my soul. I put my heart into it. Mm -hmm. I'll give my heart to you. Yeah. I'll put my heart into it, but I keep my soul to my for myself. Yeah, exactly. And if it does feel like you are selling your soul, then you're you're doing it wrong. So change your paradigm and find a way to do it that's comfortable. And, and doesn't feel that you are giving away parts of you that you don't want other people to see. That's not how it's supposed to work. So, you know, reconnect to what makes you feel good. And that's what you should be putting out there. And, and that changes over time, doesn't it? Because some of the things that I, right, I never thought I could do, I can now do and I enjoy doing and it really lifts me up. And there's other things that I thought I would want to do forever. And now I can't wait to ask somebody else to do them. And the yeah. important thing is knowing when the, that switch is happening. And I'm not always good at knowing it. But when I do know it, accepting it and being, I guess the best word would be humble and having that level of humility where I can say, I, I really don't want to do this. And I, yeah. I, even if I can do it, even if I'm good at it, it's not a healthy balance for me. It's not a healthy place for me. And I'm going to ask someone else. I also tend to, when I am humble and when I am asking for help, I tend to attract other people that have that same healthy mindset. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is. Uh, it's funny, I'm wearing this shirt. I don't know if you can see it. It says, I saw that <laughs> karma. That's nice. really what it comes down to, honestly. 
you know, it's all sort of a energy exchange and karmic. And I don't know, I'm not that woo woo of a person, but I think it ends up being our comfort level. And there's a performative aspect to social media. Some things are very produced looking, and we've seen this with, you know, influencers on, especially Instagram has become that kind of a platform where people are, you know, selling this special water. And if you drink it, you'll have perfect skin, just like me, you know, and it's just all a bunch of BS, right? You, we know fake, we instinctively as humans need to learn to trust our gut and know when we're being sold to. And so if it feels wrong, it's wrong, right? Just as in real life, we know that we're being fed a line of, you know, crap. So the same thing, if all you as an author are doing is just spamming your book links constantly, you are not going to develop authentic relationships with readers. So stop doing that and share who you are and what you're what you're about what you're interested in and connect with people with those same interests it's interesting years ago i was in sales at one point because i i, I liked it but i also needed to have a job yeah. and one of the things i practiced over and over was this understanding of you don't have to sell anything mm -hmm. one of the most important things i i recognized was number one if you believe in it mm -hmm. uh, that's going to that's going to be attractive to others sure. Number two is I need to just educate, just share, just tell people about things, just be, as you say, my authentic self. And I do find that word has a different meaning these days to me, because I can even, people can be inauthentically authentic or authentically inauthentic. Oh um, yeah. But I just have to be the best me I can in the moment. And mm -hmm. people are attracted to that. I'm yeah. in, I'm in 12 step programs. And one of the, one of the traditions is attraction rather than promotion. And I think when people are attracted, they stick. And I know I do that. I know the people that I want to be with are the people I'm attracted to, not the ones that are telling me I should. Yes. Not, the, not the ones that are saying, hey, look at me, look at me. As a matter of fact, again, I didn't find you because you were out there waving your arms up and down. Mm -hmm. You had something that you believed in. You had something you cared about. You also wrote another book called Broken Pieces, which... Yeah breaks a lot of people's heart to recognize why you wrote that, mm -hmm. uh, what the history is behind that. Uh, but there's also a sense of, I would say, authenticity that needs to be grappled with. How do I become that authentic self in a public sphere? Because there's a long, there's a long road to that. It's a lot different to learn something about marketing than it is to learn deeply about yourself and then be able to share some of those hard pieces, broken pieces, broken places. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, initially, when I wrote my first two books, they were humor books. Um, I was married at the time. Uh, eventually, I was married for 22 years. And so I wrote about re the relationship, the marital relationship, in a humorous, funny way. And, you know, just little things like, you know, there could be a refrigerator full of butter, and my ex would look at that you know, the refrigerator and go, honey, where's the butter? You know, just silly little things like that. And um, it was funny, you know, um, those books, one was called A Walk in the Snark and the other one was called The Man Code Exposed. And it wasn't just our relationship. It was generally just, um, you know, Mars and Venus kind of thing. And those books did really well on Amazon. I released those in 2011 and 12, I think. Um, back in the early days, the Wild West of, you know, Amazon and Kindle, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP. And then um, an ex, early ex of mine from my early 20s got in contact with me and um, he kind of had broken my heart, to be honest. He, we were very much in love and then he cheated on me and that was the, kind of the end of that. And I hadn't spoken to him for over 20 years and then he left me a message and it's like my knees just sort of gave out. It was just so weird to hear from him after all this time. So we've just sort of just talked on Facebook and text and it was, there was no, um, no affair or anything. It was just reconnecting. And then um, he said he would give me a message. You know, we, he would connect with me later in the day. And then I never heard from him. And I went to find out what was going on on Facebook. And there was all these messages, you know, rest in peace. And I was like, oh, my God. And he had died by suicide. And 
it just devastated me. I had literally just talked to him like that afternoon and something sort of just opened up in me and I started going through, I've always been a journaler, diary keeper for many, many, many years. I just have, you know, stacks of moleskins across my, um, you know, my library. And I had written quite a bit about that relationship. And so I just started writing what a lot of what will go into broken pieces. And so that was my first book where I sort of addressed, you know, losing somebody to suicide. And that was where I ended up going also with broken places. I ended up going through a divorce. It was my choice. There was just a lot of stuff that happened that had nothing to do with, you know, the loss of this ex-love. But I really changed at that point. I really um, decided it's time to talk about what happened when I was 11 years old. And I had never told my ex what happened, um, the ex love that died by suicide until we started reconnecting. And he had been over to my house many, many times and had seen the neighbor and always thought he was kind of weird. And it was a neighbor dad who was the abuser. And um, he's like, he said, why didn't you ever tell me? And I said, oh, I was pretty much sure you'd end up, you know, in an altercation with them because he had high risk behavior and ended up an alcoholic. And so there were just a lot of things that I worried about. And I just didn't come clean, come clean, like I did something wrong. I still have that, that behavior in my head, those terms um, to him or to anybody for many, many years. My family knew, of course, because there were, um, there, I had to testify in two trials about it. Uh, both a civil trial and a military trial. But but it wasn't, I mean, it was public, but it wasn't public because you were actually not, uh, your name wasn't down the, in the papers, was it? No, no, because I was so young. I was 12 when I testified. So, so you could have spent the rest of your life behind that veil, couldn't you? And I did. I mean, I, it wasn't until I was 35 and had my, my first child, my daughter, that I sought help for it because I ended up having postpartum depression. I just completely freaked out. Like, how am I gonna keep her safe? How do I prevent what's happened to me from happening to her? So all of this ended up in the first book. I you know, decided, well, I have more to say, so I'll go ahead and write the next book. And now I'm finishing up the third book. But it Which sort is. of created this movement of people coming to me and telling me their stories on mostly Twitter, but Facebook and email too. And I thought, you know, I need to do something. And this was back in 2013, long before Me Too or any of these other movements had, had started. So I ended up starting Sex Abuse Chat out of that. That's been very helpful to me. And I know a lot of people and we engage every week there and it's yeah. a pretty open form that is protected. We are out in public, but we keep we keep ourselves safe and we know each other and have not a lot of rules of the road, so to speak, but we have a lot of guidance. And a lot of what we're talking about today, we probably could have, should have, would have started this with a trigger warning. Somebody, anyone who's listening this today, we are talking about some very serious subjects. We veered off rather quickly from marketing and book marketing into things like uh, I, this past week, last week, over the, over the last week, I have lost someone to suicide. Uh, even the word suicide is a hard one for a lot of people to say and even harder for many people to hear. And I think it's one of the most important things that we talk about, not only in this day and age, but always. It's important not to demystify, that's not a word that I like to use, but to destigmatize, reduce the stigma on talking about suicide. I know that I've had suicidal tendencies, I've had suicidal thoughts, I've been depressed. And talking about that, of course, privately made, gave me a, a place to really uh, heal and to grow. But talking about it publicly, I think, as you say, gives other people a place to really understand I'm not alone. I don't have to do this alone. And there are other people like me out there that are living full lives and working towards an even fuller expression of who they are. I know that when we talk about suicide and we talk about child sexual abuse, which both you and I have had some experiences with, the real piece that comes into play most often is are there ties between being abused? And for me, there was also addiction and then there was also the adoption and the abandonment. Are there ties between that 
in your in your life or just in general in knowledge and suicidal ideation and suicidal tendencies well it's very common for survivors to have these types of thoughts i mean i was 11 and it was happening and you know there was um gun violence involved i won't go into that but it was very real and i was terrified of course and um, at one point, and I write about this, um, I think in Broken Places, it kind of blurs together after a while, so I apologize, I don't know which book it was in, where I went into my folks' medicine cabinet at 11 and saw all of these pills. And, you know, my parents were fairly healthy, but, you know, they still, my mom had blood pressure, my dad had stomach issues, you know, just typical stuff that parents have. and. I want, at one point I thought, well, what if I just take a bunch of these pills? Will it stop? But I, I was, you know, not knowledgeable enough to know if any of these meds would work. And so that deterred me, which is good. I mean, that's, that's why they give them complicated names. I ended up working in big pharma for 17 years. And so of course they all had, you know, the the caps to keep them safe from children and, and all that. So it ended up just being completely overwhelming for me. And I ended up just in my room listening to Pat Benatar, right? So um, she saved me. I always say that. I, I believe it. I believe it. She absolutely saved me. Um, and I write about her in Broken People, which is my new book. Um, but I never said anything to my parents. So it's not uncommon for children who are going through it to see that as a way out because we don't, we're not powerful enough to make it stop. No, we're not only not powerful enough to make it stop and you're right, we don't have a real understanding of why we even have the thoughts. No. And I, I don't care, I know for me, I'm in my 50s, I'm in my late 50s for goodness sakes, almost Same. in my 60s, it's getting weird to say these things. I know, I'm 57. I'm 58, goodness gracious. And you know, any moment now, we'll just be turning that corner and yet I'm still learning. I'm still, I'm still amazed at the things that I'm amazed at. Yeah. There are, there's, there's a new way that I've learned to understand what happened to me all those years in my mind. I was unable to really understand the depression, uh, the mood disorder, the abuse that had happened and the pieces of my life that had broken and the people around me that were broken. I, I, I felt it, I saw it, I knew it, I internalized it and I was self-destructing, but I couldn't put it all together and have an understanding. But I can tell yeah. you one thing I was doing all that time and I really understand it now, I was taking notes. Mm -hmm. I would look around me and if I heard something about suicide, I wasn't chagrined. I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if that would work for me. Now that sounds like an insane way to look at the world. I'm yeah, taking I notes on get it. Yeah. I'm taking notes on someone who died. I'm looking at what happened to their family. Oh, they all got over it. Oh, it was great. you know, they grieved, but they're okay now. Well, gee, yeah. I guess if I did that, my family would grieve and be okay. And I'm taking notes and I'm it's almost like I'm strategizing yes. for that ultimate thing that's going to happen because I can't be here. I don't know right. when or how. And that's, that's really hard to talk about, but yeah. especially when you can't even internalize what's happening and such a shameful way to think of the world. How could I have such a full life or you know, even, even a good day? Gosh, there's, there's gonna be a good day today or tomorrow or the next day, hold on for that. And that's really not what mental health is all about, is it? No, and, and what's amazing to me is how many people, grown adults would say, well, why didn't you tell why didn't you say anything about it and they have no comprehension of well remember when you were 11 and you were collecting baseball cards and playing jacks and you know you had your nose stuck in a um you know are you there god it's me margaret or whatever book by judy bloom you weren't thinking about how to make the neighbor stop sexually abusing you and then You'd like, I had no concept of the fact that I was having panic attacks. I didn't know it had a name. My body started having these weird inflammatory conditions. Like my, uh, the bone, I have kind of bony hands anyway, but the bones in my hands would get very inflamed. And so my parents would took me to an arthritis, a rheumatologist, doc, you know, a rheumatologist to find out if I had some kind of weird arthritis. Of course I didn't. 
And then I went to some other doctor. Oh, I was having um, the first sign for me that I'm having anxiety, which I still have to this day, is that I can't get a deep breath. Mm. I just have very shallow breathing. And if I don't catch it and start doing deep breathing exercises, I will go into a full on panic attack, which I had many of, but I didn't know it had a name or why I was having it. We have no concept of the, that these are mental health issues that are being caused by the abuse because we're young children. Right. And there's, and, while, yeah. while you were, while you were reading your Judy Bloom and listening to Pat Benatar, who I love too, I yeah. was probably listening to America and, you know, reading uh, the Hardy Boys at that point. I found, yeah. I found that my, my mother would bring home a Hardy Boys book. If she brought home one, I would read it till two in the morning. If she brought home two, I'd read it till six in the morning. I yeah. just would fully immerse myself in anything yeah. that got me out of my head. Exactly. Anything took me out of that sense of, as you say, what I couldn't identify as anxiety. My, my symptoms are, I, I, my blood pressure rises, which I never knew that was actually happening. And yeah. I get these terrible headaches. I didn't know that. I thought I should just take some, some Advils, take a Tylenol, get through right. it. Right. And I didn't recognize that I actually was suffering from anxiety. I was ha probably on the verge of a panic attack. Life mm -hmm. was about to go off the rails, but who could have, who could have, who could have foretold that? And yeah. I think that there's one of the things that you and I have in common is the generational. Today, I know as a parent and as a grandparent, I understand so much more. And so all of us through the internet and just through all the experiences that uh, we have with other people and listening to, to uh, broadcasts like this, we really can understand the, the, mental, the aspects of mental health that our, our, that our children might be exhibiting. And we have a way of now addressing that. I don't think from, you said your parents were in their eighties, mine, my mom's right upstairs. Hi mom. Yeah. Uh, my parents, you know, my mom's in her nineties, dad's not with us anymore. They didn't have those resources. They didn't even have that understanding. And the bare bones understanding that they had came from people like social workers and maybe doctors who had even less of an understanding. So I think we are in a place now, there's a great class that I was just reading about Yale has put on. And I think the first time they did it was in 2018. And it was the only time it was face to face. It's called the happiness class. Oh, and I don't know if you've heard about it, but it, it took off a little bit after that. It's on Coursera, I think, and you can take it. Uh, but during the pandemic this past year, it's like 3.3 million people have taken That's this. Amazing it. Most of us understand some of the basics of our physical health happiness mm -hmm. right being mm -hmm. happy physically but this is really focusing on how that all ties into the mental health happiness mm -hmm. and a mental health perspective there wasn't even a concept back in the 1960s or 70s when i was born and raised of mental health happiness mm -hmm. well you know I, I love the quote people always throw out by abe lincoln well people are just about as happy as they make up their mind to be and I'm like, not when they're being molested, not when they're being raped, not when they're being abused, not yeah. when they're feeling anxiety to the point that that's chemi the chemical imbalance is so profound that they don't even, I, could, I couldn't even understand that happiness existed. Um, I, I think none of us uh, as survivors wanted to ever be part of this tribe that we are part of, but here we are. And then I get to meet wonderful people like you. Um, and I, I think we, rec we recognize damage when we meet people. It's almost like a sixth sense, if you will. And I think there's a certain amount of compassion that survivors have that maybe people who haven't been through any kind of trauma, particularly as a child, whether that's neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, whatever, um, emotional abuse and psychological abuse um, that we've had to learn to survive. And so I, I truly believe that that um, sends us on a path to learn how to cope with life in a way that people who've had it very easy, uh, and I don't mean that in a way that's negative in any way, shape or form. I'm thrilled when people have had a wonderful life. I am too. Yeah, I am too. I, I have gratitude for their joy. It's absolutely. And it's like, I hope you never experienced this. But for myself and those around me, 
I believe that we're all more attuned to each other or have learned how to be attuned to each other. And it helps us grow. And when we're not, that's okay, because then it's an opportunity for further learning and education. And so I do feel like had I not experienced it, I wouldn't be able to interact with so many survivors. I wouldn't have been able to write books about it. I do believe I would have been a writer anyway, because I knew at the age of five that I wanted to be a writer. And it took a lot of different circuitous routes to get to this point, but that's where I am. But I think that also is very healing. It doesn't change what happened in the past. A lot of people say, you know, it must have been so cathartic to write those books. And I say, you know, not really. There's, there, it doesn't change the way that my brain and body and pure physiology are now, as you mentioned, the chemical reactions are still gonna be there. That's my body and my mind and my brain have all now been switched to a certain way to handle you know, hypervigilance and all that kind of stuff. But there is post-traumatic growth. And I'm absolutely 100% on board with that belief system where, you know, it doesn't, I don't feel like I'm depressed or anxious because of what happened. It's a byproduct of that, but I've always moved forward. I've always, you know, been very ambitious and successful at my various job, you know, jobs or my company or writing. And it doesn't define me. It's part of me, but it isn't the only part of me. I know for me as an author, uh, Dear Stephen Michael's Mother, which you know I, I wrote as a, a real expose in all these areas that are very traumatic. And many people have asked me, boy, same as you, uh, was that really therapeutic for you? I think is the phrase that I hear people use quite often. Yeah. And I say, jokingly over a while, I came up and I said, oh no, no. And I say, but thank God I had a lot of therapy before I started writing. <laughs> right? uh, you know, there was this real joy that I was at a place where I could write like I can talk about it, like I could yeah. write about it, like I can express myself in these YouTube series yeah. without re-traumatizing myself. The, yeah. the PTSD wasn't the point of writing it. I didn't want to dive in and write this so that I could re-traumatize myself. Right. But I had healed from a lot of that PTSD. I'd, and as you say, the healing is sometimes really so overwhelmingly wonderful that I, I almost don't sense those chemical imbalances sometimes. Exactly. There's a real joy in my life many days. Yeah. But, but I am surprised sometimes that they still rear their head. And then yeah. I become more comfortable with the fact that, no, I'm, I'm wired a little differently and I can heal. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't mean that the rewiring is, is gone. It doesn't mean that it's disappeared. And I'm more okay with that today than ever before. Yeah, for example, um, my daughter and I, she's 21, Anya, has um, social anxiety and has uh, OCD, and she's very open about it. She's started around fifth grade with it, and we were talking about dissociation. Now, this is an example. I didn't know that I was dissociating when it was happening during the abuse and after the abuse, and to this day, I mean, I can literally dissociate at this in a snap. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing. I didn't know there was a name for it. I didn't know that that was my brain protecting me. And so she says she does that occasionally, but not on command. She'll just see herself, you know, like in her room doing homework and she'll be, and she'll be hovering over and watching herself. And that's when she knows that she's having anxiety. And then I was talking to my son about it and he's 15. He's just a gregarious, funny kid, no issues at all. And um, that we've seen anyway. And so I was talking to him about it and he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about, mom. <laughs> so it's just so interesting. And so when I was talking to my mom about all this stuff and she's like, I have never done that. I can't even conceive of, of what dissociation is and i'm so sorry that you experienced that you know like you said they 
they did the best they could. They just weren't educated. No, and and you know you're talking about uh, the um, the heritage of mental illness and some of the biological chemical imbalances. Uh, my my dilemma was compounded in the fact that I was adopted, and so I could look at my whole family around me and talk about feeling like a black sheep. I was a black sheep of the black sheep's, and it was just something else. And when I, in, in the book, Dear Stephen Michael's Mother, they know there's a search for my biological family. And when I, at the end of that search, started to discover parts of my roots, parts of my genetic makeup, it was an enormous, I, I hate to use this word, but relief. Oh, gee, mom was bipolar, depressed? Oh, uncle so-and-so was an alcoholic. You know, my sister was meth addict. Oh, there's some, there's some roots here. There's some, you know, genetic roots. That doesn't mean that, oh, that explains everything. I'm done now. I can just move forward. It right. just helped me to understand a little more. And I think that's what I really want is this idea of I've got to be patient with myself. Yeah. This understanding of who I am is never going to be complete. But yeah. I can, as you say, continue to move forward in that understanding. It allows me to be patient with others. It allows me to hopefully be able to ask people, be patient with me. I'm doing the best. I'm not only doing the best I can, I'm doing actually really, really, really well, yeah. even though my head's exploding right now in yeah. full anxiety, even though I can barely speak to you right now. Mm -hmm. my, my wife is, of course, the primary uh, recipient of those moments uh, sure. you know, when things are really rough. Yeah. And that understanding we have of like, you know, where we're at, because I'll feel so guilty and shameful at times. Hopefully the shame is not not prevalent. But the guilt, I'll say, oh, I'm so sorry I mean, you're going through this. She said, well, of course you're going through that. So it's really helpful when we share these things as appropriate and we continue to grow in, in harmony with the people that love us and care about us. I'm going to ask you before we wrap up, because there's there's an excitement for me. This is the first time that I'm going to hear this. And maybe the, I guess it's the first time maybe everyone anyone's going to hear this out loud. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> we have broken pieces. We have broken places. But Broken People is the next upcoming release from Rachel Thompson. And, and I'm not going to ask you about where you are in that process. I know you're editing. I'm going to guess that you're picking something to read for us today that you feel confident about. And so I'm going to give you the microphone and I'm going to be quiet. Quiet, please. Okay, so this is a piece from my next broken book uh, called Broken People, and I'm in final edits, and this piece is called Elements on Fire. It's all in the ending, regardless of how it begins, causing water to steam, fire to crackle, earth to heat, air to move. The elements are angry, my worry stones tell me, as I roll them across my aching fingers, biting at my bones. Heavy bones, tired of the weight I carry, this burden of a love I'm supposed to feel, one that is written and raised, sun pinging off a peeling gold, golden seal, perfunctorily created in some airy office in California by an hourly clerk I've never met intimacy marked by agency, diametrically opposed. What a strange little dance we've created, this business of love, that which started from binding twine or ribbon to one-upmanship and millions of dollars in flowers that die, of clear shiny rocks pulled out of caves on the backs of babies, of twinkly lights that carry no meaning. Yet if every intimacy of marriage is different, how is it that the human condition of energy and fluid exchange is no different? The song remains the same. My body moves me forward because that's where I'm supposed to be. I can't go back to that silent place of quiet fury and prickling doubt, feeling my worry stones compelling me to move, go, jump girl, take responsibility, taking responsibility, blaming myself for not creating enough crackling fire or earthy warmth. Yet in the end, it wasn't about that really. It's not about me or him or us. It's not about shedding the skins of blame or dusting the detritus of what little clarity remains. It's about the energy surrounding us, undulating in circular waves and unseen infinite patterns. 
It's a lie that all the elements work together in unison. They fight for prominence, just as we fight for the one we need, filling our core, giving us life. I needed air to move, to end, to begin. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. Before we wrap up, folks, I want Rachel to just have a second to let her let you all know where uh, she can get in touch. You can get in touch with her. Rachel, can you tell the folks? Sure. Um, I have two websites uh, for my writing about sexual abuse and relationships and divorce. Obviously, that's what that was about. Um, Rachelintheoc.com on Twitter. I'm Rachel in the OC. It's R A C H E L, which is the right way to spell it. Um, <laughs> Also on Facebook, I'm Rachel Thompson, author, Instagram, Rachel in the OC. And for business, I'm Bad Redhead Media. So it's the same, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the website is badredheadmedia.com. And my books are all on Amazon. So you can go ahead and check me out there. And all these links will be down below in the description, folks. So if you're watching this on YouTube, just go ahead and scroll down. Make sure that you like this video. Make sure you share this with others. If you get a chance, make some comments down below. Rachel would love to hear from you. She'll be yeah. keeping an eye on this, I'm sure. And uh, make sure that you tune in and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Rachel, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me, Kevin. It's a I'm total sure. joy. I'm sure we'll be doing stuff again, again in the future. Yes, I love it. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Take care.